Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining this workshop, uh, this panel discussion. Um, and this is the day before World Homelessness Day. Uh, welcome to one of our De Montfort University research sessions. Um, this is such an important topic. It's something that um, whether you're working in the homelessness sector, the housing sector, in university, uh, you'll be reading about this. You'll be um, involved in um, volunteering activity around this, um, but it can't have escaped anybody's attention um, that this is such a, an issue. So we wanted to mark the occasion of World Homelessness Day and talk about some of the applied research that we do here at De Montfort University in Leicester. Um, my name's Jo Richardson. I'm Professor of Housing and Social Inclusion in the Faculty of Business and Law. Um, I'm also Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty, so I get to work with hundreds of fantastic researchers across the university and in our faculty. Um, my own area is in housing and homelessness and social inclusion. Um, and I work with a number of colleagues uh, in the city of Leicester and across the country as well. So I am uh, extremely pleased to be involved in this day and uh, to introduce some of my colleagues. So I am just going to start my slideshow now. Lovely. So I just want to introduce what we're going to talk to you about um, over the next, I would say, 40 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions and answers. I would ask you uh, to put in your questions. Uh, you'll see a button called Stream Chat. If you put your questions in there as you think of them, um, and then we've got a couple of colleagues here who are going to help um, me collate those, um, and I can ask them of all of our panel today later on after we have finished going through the slides. So please use that to put in comments or questions and we will have time uh, between now and two o'clock to have a discussion, have a debate um, about what we're, what we're covering today. So I'm going to start off um, the session, just really to talk about what we mean by home. Um, it sounds very obvious, um, but it's more than bricks and mortar. So I'm going to cover that quite briefly um, before then introducing my colleague, Simon Stevens, who's going to talk about how we might imagine public spaces, how we might rethink them to reduce hostility to homeless people. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Simon on that. After Simon, I'm really thrilled to welcome Mark Grant, who is Chief Executive of Action Homeless, a really important charity in our city, does some amazing work. Um, so. Uh, be thrilled to hear what Mark and the team have been doing to respond to the COVID-19 crisis. Look at some of the lessons that have been learned during that crisis and perhaps uh, what we can start to think about um, instead of going back to business as usual, uh, what we might think about for the future. And then I'm really pleased as well to welcome Mark Charlton, who will help finish up the session. Um, and he's going to talk about how DMU is a university with a social heart. We say it, um, is part of all of our, our strategic thinking. Uh, we're very embedded in the city um, and our research shows that, but Mark is going to talk about that a bit more um, and he's going to talk about what we have learned as a university. So the university isn't about transmitting research, transmitting information. We like to engage with co-production approaches. We like to learn from the city uh, and see it very much as a shared approach to learning um, and embedding some of the lessons. So that's broadly what we're going to cover. So you know what you're here for. Uh, sit back, enjoy the, dis the discussions, and please do put those Q&A um, into the stream chat so that we can have a debate afterwards. So the meaning of home, what do we mean by it? Um, I think it's a, a feeling. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to describe. Um, I, I've written about this. Um, I've been a researcher for 20 years. Uh, before that, I've worked in practice. So I've been a housing officer, I've worked with homeless people, I've worked in lettings, I've worked in housing policy. And I wrote a book last year, a short book, um, they're the best kind of books, um, a short book on place and identity, the performance of home. And uh, this really looked at um, my research over the last 20 years and my experience as a practitioner as well. And I found that there were six conditions over all of that at that time of doing the research, six conditions uh, which help us understand what, what home, home means. Um, the first is security, um, and this links in a little bit to uh, when we're thinking about housing first approaches. Um, 
if somebody feels safe and secure in their home, if they know that they've got that home for more than a night, you can start to make plans for the future. Um, if you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow night, it's very difficult then to work out how you might be able to recover, how you might be able to apply for work, how you might be able to retain a meaningful relationship, um, start a family, all of those kind of things which help us um, be happy humans, basically. So that's the first one, security. Um, second one is safety. Um, we need to be safe in our homes, um, safe within the brick walls, so not in a damp space, a dangerous space, um, but also safe from other human beings. Um, so I think people have talked about domestic and family violence. Um, this can be a contributor to homelessness. So safety um, in your in your space, I think, helps create that that feeling of home, helps create the meaning of home. Uh, this, the uh, third condition, quality of space. Um, again, we've seen this. We've got a, a survey, a national survey that's running on, on housing. Um, housing is part of that national survey, I should say. Um, lots of different aspects of people's lives. And there are five or six questions on housing. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic and we've seen people who don't have space to work because some people are working from home, don't have space perhaps for children to do homework. This all creates a tension between you and the space around you and it, it can cause a bit of a, a dissonance um, between what, what, what you're, you're feeling and, and the bricks and mortar around you. So I think quality of space is really important. Um, as is privacy, uh, for similar kind of reasons. So if you can't find a place to be yourself, um, if you can't find an outdoor bit of garden, a tiny bit of patio even, any anything, if you can't find a sort of private outdoor space, uh, we have found that during COVID-19 uh, that has major impacts on physical and mental well-being. The, the fifth um, uh, condition is connectedness. So our, our homes shouldn't be um, Static brick walls, if you like, there should be a permeability, um, but that still allows privacy. Uh, we should be able to feel connected to our families, our loved ones, and our neighbourhood. And there may be some benefits that we've seen during the impact of the pandemic, where we have seen neighbourhoods um, creating that connectedness. Um, and then finally, and this is a big one, um, affordability. And by this, I mean properly affordable. Uh, not the term that is used spuriously in um, uh, documentation about affordable homes. I mean, council and housing association social rents. Um, affordable sometimes in, in government documentation can mean up to 80% of uh, market rents. And if you're living in a very expensive global city, that's not affordable, not for, not for many people at all. So home needs to be affordable really don't want to be spending more than 30% of net income on a home. Uh, that then pushes out other areas of life uh, that there's a, a need um, uh, for, for income uh, towards. So I'm talking about properly affordable um, housing linked to people's income. So it's more than a roof. We can see that. These six conditions suggest that a home is more than a roof, and yet a roof is a very, very important start point. Um, we do need to go beyond thinking of just shelter. We need to be thinking about um, longer term, uh, secure shelter with support, something that people can start to create their home out of. Housing is vital to our well-being. Um, I think it's the ultimate public health intervention. We saw this during the pandemic, and we'll hear more on this later from Mark Grant at Action Homeless. Um, but the Everybody In campaign saw people in warm accommodation, sometimes with hot food delivered, with support. We could see it could be mobilised really very quickly, but we need a sustainable approach now. I think we're seeing people coming out of that, um, that period of the Everybody In campaign, um, and we'll start to see the knock-on effects of that, of people being back on the street. Um, but housing is absolutely vital to our well-being. And as I said earlier, that's physical and mental well-being. And bearing in mind that tomorrow is not just um, World Homelessness Day, it's also World Mental Health Day. It's important to find the connections here. Um, and then the, the third bullet point I have on this slide is just to remind us that housing should be first. It should be the start. Um, it's the, the thing that uh, 
uh, needs to be in place, but it must also link in the support for people so that they can fully live in their housing, so they can turn that housing into a home. Um, so it's it's very important uh, to see the, the connectedness uh, to and from a, a home, a, a bricks and mortar dwelling, um, and, and to leave that additional support. So we need to see some uh, short and some long-term solutions. As I've mentioned, the uh, fantastic short-term response, the pandemic, um, sort of organisations coming together, really pulling together and mobilising quickly. Um, but there's a need to think about our spaces and places, uh, to think about um, beyond our own individual uh, dwelling places. Um, and we need to think about what our city might look like, what might a friendly homelessness city look like, um, public areas. Uh, that, that aren't hostile um, to, to different uses, uh, to diverse uses. And we'll hear more on that from Simon in just a moment. Uh, but I also think we must work with government to consider the place of social, properly affordable housing. Um, it seems so obvious, um, but it does need to still keep being said. Um, investment in building sufficient social rented homes, in my mind, and according to the evidence I've collected over the last 20 years is crucial. Uh, we must build more homes um, if we are to prevent homelessness. Um, as I say, it seems so obvious, but it needs saying again and again. Um, so there's a mixture of short and long-term solutions because building more homes isn't going to happen overnight, um, but we really must get to that point. Um, the Chartered Institute of Housing and the National Housing Federation are calling on government uh, to look at uh, getting on with um, with building um, socially rented uh, homes um, and perhaps getting over the obsession that we have with owner occupied um, and shared ownership products uh, and perhaps going back to basics and, and thinking about uh, what we need to be doing for, for long term solutions. So that's a, a quick run through, a quick introduction really to uh, uh, my thoughts on housing and homelessness and what we need to be thinking about short and long term. Um, but now it, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Dr. Simon Stevens, uh, who's going to talk to us about the architecture of our public spaces and homelessness. And I think in just one moment, you will start to see Simon's slides coming up. So over to you, Dr. Simon Stevens. Thanks very much, Joe. I hope everybody enjoyed their lunch or is looking forward to a good lunch after today's conference. So, yeah, I'm going to take on a, a little journey to begin with. Uh, I want us to imagine that we are detectives and we're going to have a walk because we're looking for a witness, a witness to a crime. But there's a technicality because our witness is homeless. So we know we can't just go to an address or something like that to get a witness statement. We've got a, a description. So we think perhaps, well, you know, look, we'll go to all those kind of stereotypical trope places in public space that, that we think that homeless people hang out and do stuff. So perhaps the first place we'll go to are places of just basic shelter, right? So like a, a park bench. And when, you, and when you wander across to that park bench, you see that there are armrests on there. And yesterday when you were sitting there, you were thinking, well, that's obviously there, you know, so I can put my coffee on the side or to help old people get up. A genuine claim from Oxford City Council. That's why they installed them. Even though when you go onto uh, websites to look at uh, companies that provide designs for these uh, benches, they're called specifically anti-vagrant benches or maybe you go under a sort of bridge where there are uh, spikes and things that you thought were there to stop skateboarders in public spaces perhaps even late at night having sort of searched all day and not really had much luck and you're becoming more suspicious about what public space is being shaped like and why it's being shaped in a certain way you come across a, a train station such as, uh, as discovered in, in Bournemouth well, they, for a short while, instigated a campaign of playing bagpipe music overnight between the hours of midnight and 6 a.m. to disperse rough sleepers. Now, I've got nothing against bagpipe music. It was just interesting that during the day they were playing classical music to calm travellers and commuters. And in the evening they were switching to this other type of music and playing the same three tracks over and over again. Right? So this all starts to make us a little bit suspicious about the physical shaping of public space. And this isn't to sort of recreate tripe stereotypes you know we, i don't think we actually think that homeless people perhaps go and sleep on benches right but it's about the messages that are given to homeless people when they see these things 
And we'll think about this a little bit more because then perhaps as you're walking around looking at all these physical changes, you're a detective, right? So you start to think, well, I'll, maybe I should look into some of the legislation. Uh, has, have, have the laws changed around antisocial behavior and legislating against it in public space? So you come across this thing with a, a quick search on the internet. Maybe you're sitting at one of those internet cafes that has locked toilets and says for customer use only. And on your internet search, you discover something called a public spaces protection order. It's a very interesting piece of legislation because it's effectively a blank check where councils get to decide what counts as antisocial behavior relative to their context. And that has some, some definite pros to it. But we are, have found sort of in places that are a bit more touristic, say Oxford or Bournemouth, that they start to populate these public spaces protection orders, what, what counts as antisocial, as homeless survival strategies, if you like. So we start to see things like begging, rough sleeping, uh, populated as antisocial behaviours. And how does this work in combination with the physical shape in your public space. Well, I mean, particularly in London, this is a picture of a bank uh, underground. You're seeing a, a huge shift over from public toilets and public facilities. I mean, there used to be, you know, wash basins and showers and these things. Uh, and now they're kind of pay as you use toilets. And in, in the same spaces, we're seeing legislation against urinating public, obviously, and begging. So the shaping of public space is sending these very hostile messages to homeless people at the same time as making this idea that there is a legitimate presence in public space and an illegitimate presence in public space. And there's some, some lines in this legislation that are very telling in some of the antisocial behaviour uh, legislation. I think this idea that a PSBO can be brought in on the likelihood that something will be continued, an antisocial act will be happening. And if you happen to be a person that needs to sleep or urinate or eat, i.e. like all of us, you're sort of an antisocial behavior time bomb. So again, we see this criminalizing of a status. And again, I don't think this is something that will go unnoticed by homeless people. So we've got hostile architecture, we've got hostile legislation, and sometimes we've seen creeping in in a couple of instances this idea of hostile messages. So reinforcing this illegitimate presence in public space through messages and posters. This one was put up in Nottingham, and it was so, I mean, it's so offensive that actually there was a campaign to take it down. But I have seen some of these slip through the net. So in Brighton, for example, Again, the use of language is very interesting. The train station, they were putting up signs saying beggars operate in this area. And operate is a really interesting word. So as a detective, you think, well, yeah, operate is something that we use to describe thieves, right? And this is in direct relation to the action of begging. Now, these messages seem to contradict the other types of hostile strategies, whereas sort of some of the hostile legislation and hostile architecture is kind of veiled from us slightly. Here is a clear, explicit sort of message about an unwelcome presence in public space. So why is this all happening? And, and I do want to reiterate, there are some councils that, that are, are you know, not engaging in this, of course. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm sure that we'll hear a lot more about Leicester later on from Mark. But what I find interesting about this, here's a, a statement from Rushcliffe Council about their public spaces protection order saying that they're not targeting the homeless because there are services available. So they're choosing not to access those services. So the idea of a hostile public space is that it's a kind of tough love approach that pushes homeless people towards those existing rehabilitative networks. And that kind of twists the narrative a bit into homelessness as some kind of willful choice. And that's a problem for me, I think. And we could talk about whether or not how extensively this network is readily available. But I think there's people here today that are more qualified to talk about that than I am. You know, gaps in services, in, in particular with the sort of everyone in uh, reaction and where that goes afterwards. We could talk about whether or not uh, aid has certain criteria attached to it. So it becomes not, not an unconditional uh, rehabilitative network, if you like. What I find very interesting, here's, a, here's an interesting piece of information that when the government released a lot of this uh, money and funding for uh, charities and shelters and, and homeless net, uh, aid networks, there was a, a little point in it put in that anything that was of an overtly political nature would not be funded. Now, of course, this seems instinctive, right? 
providing for someone's kind of well-being and survival comes before anything else. But what's very interesting about that is this idea that a sort of political status, a right to a political voice is somehow separate from survival. And I think the 20th century has taught us that that's a very dangerous idea to have. Um, you know, uh, Jewish people were stripped of their citizenship before they were put into concentration camps. Now, I don't want to sort of be so extreme, but we have to be very wary of this kind of depoliticizing narrative. There's a lot of ethnographic research in America, which talks about the idea of a culture of homelessness. And this is something that I would like to further explore in the UK context. But some very ba basic conclusions from this is that when, you know, when you're rejected so much by mainstream society, when this hostile architecture is being physically put in front of you, in front, you know, in public space, you're naturally going to look for some kind of acceptance and support elsewhere. And a lot of the time, that's obviously other homeless people. So rather than sort of having this idea that we are creating a hostile environment as part of a tough love approach, as, as is claimed by Rushcliffe Council, I think what it actually is doing is setting up emotional and psychological barriers to accessing that help. You know, you're offering help with one hand and punishing. You know, it's almost like you're, that creates a right to punish in public space, homeless people's presence, if you like. What worries me is that sort of the COVID situation may intensify this because the the more that the narrative comes out from uh, MPs that there is you know help increasingly made avail available the more that means that existing homelessness is again willfulness and I think that that is what powers this idea of a hostile public space that they're there willfully. I think it's very interesting to think about uh, the increasing risk that homeless people will be seen as a public health factor as well. And there's lots to say around biopolitics of that. So I'm worried about how COVID is going to affect and further in, kind of create a hostile public space. So just to kind of wrap up, though, there's one more thing I just I did want to say about this which might provoke some questions. Or Generally, political theory literature and stuff like this tries to de-other the homeless by re-emphasizing another status, like the rights of a citizen and things like that. I think we have to be aware of the fact that we almost instinctively other the homeless into an antisocial presence, because what counts as antisocial is often defined and informed by the fact that we have a home. If you're doing something in public which should be done at home, you are automatically being othered by, by, by the rest of us. And I think Joe's kind of touched on that, talking about what a home actually means in terms of privacy. But it also means that you don't come across as antisocial because you have a space to go and do those private activities. And that's really, that's all it for me. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more about uh, action homeless and stuff like that and see how, if any of this relates to anything that Mark wants to talk about. So thank you. Simon, thank you very much indeed. I think that's really good food for thought because uh, we can come up with some assumptions based on who we are and, and where we're based and don't necessarily think I, I talked about the condition of privacy and, and that's exactly it. Some of these private functions, if you don't have a space to undertake them and for them to be seen as antisocial, um, it's perhaps not, not something that crosses people's minds every day. Um, so I think it's really important to have opened up that debate um, and, and get people reflecting on that. Um, I'm, I'd love to see some questions. I've got a couple of questions I can see coming through, which we'll touch on towards the end. But if anyone's got any thoughts on that, um, please do put that um, in the chat. Uh, Simon, Dr. Simon Stevens, thank you very much again for that. Um, I'm now oh, going look. to welcome uh, Mark Grant from Action Homeless. Uh, Mark is Chief Executive Officer at Action Homeless. And I think Mark is just starting to share his slides now. So over to you, Mark. Thank you. Whilst we've got this small technical glitch, I'm going to. Mark, can you hear me? Um, you're on mute at the moment. Just see if you can see it at the bottom of the screen. Hopefully, the mute right. button. Perfect. Sorry, everybody. Over to you, Mark. Uh, 
that's that schoolboy error. You always remember to set yourself up new. After six months, you thought we'd learn how to do these things, but we're not. Um, apologies, everybody. Just um, going back to uh, my interrupt introduction. Um, the last six months have been very challenging, and um, we started out at the beginning of the pandemic very worried about what would happen to homeless people um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, if you're not aware, the average uh, mortality rate for homeless people um, is around the 40s, uh, mid 40s. It's not changed in over 30 years. I've been involved in homelessness almost that long. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the health needs and underlying issues for homeless people means that they, that they tend to live very short lives. Um, that's compounded with a range of um, issues, starting from often very much in childhood, have first childhood experiences, and often reinforced in terms of their lifestyles and um, their, their their experiences um, uh, for being homeless. So we had some thoughts that perhaps one in 10 homeless people would suffer very badly from the virus and even die. Um, and one of the real eye openers and actually positives if there, if there is any is that we've not seen that um, we've not seen that in Leicester and we've not seen that across the country and even in Europe uh, actually homeless people haven't um, been infected um, particularly badly by the virus people have had had the virus but they haven't um, ha um, haven't died or haven't been seriously ill um, and we still yet to find out why that is um, but one of the things that did help was the everyone in uh, campaign and actually within Leicester we started that well before we were told by um, central government that we needed to get people into safe and secure accommodation so uh, we we managed to achieve that by um, by by the end of March the 27th of March um, where we had everybody uh, who was currently staying um, either in insecure night shelters or were sleeping um, into um, secure accommodation and back to what the, what Joe put up at, at the beginning in terms of what, what was secure accommodation. That was people having their own home, their own ensuite facilities where possible, uh, having all their primary needs met for them. Um, and um, literally within a week, we got over 100 people into accommodation. And that was done very much as a partnership between um, the local council, the city council, who secured um, private sector accommodation, um, either through um, apartments or hotels or homeless organisations, moving people through as quick as they could into more permanent accommodation and opening up other accommodation as well. So we managed to achieve that. Um, however, that also saw a massive surge in the number of people suddenly presenting. So, you know, we all took a deep breath and said, oh, look, we've got we've got lots of people in. And then suddenly we um, we started to get new people presenting. And the other challenge was that actually everything was closed. So um, Leicester has a, 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 a good array of agencies and uh, facilities and support across the city to help people who present as homeless day centres, outreach services and and, and, and um, other support services, um, but they 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 shut down. You know, we were told to shut those. All day centres are shut down, and suddenly we were seeing people just just appearing on the streets who'd, who'd literally been kicked out of wherever they were sofa surfing because the people was, they were living were saying that there's too many people living here or it's not safe. And so you know, the everyone in was a was was a challenge, and then we started to realise that we needed to, to to keep going around that. And over the last six months, we've had over 500 people who are presented as homeless, and we still have around 150 people um, still needing housing and accommodation. What's been interesting over those last six months is um, perhaps it perhaps it dispels some of the the normal ways and the normal assumptions that we've made around. Uh, working with homeless people, and particularly um, the term that we use in actual homeless is chronic homeless people, people with long, long histories of street homelessness and, and, and often been through a revolving door. And what we found actually is, is, is back to what Joe put up in terms of what a home means, that if you give people safe, secure home, um, give them the level of privacy that they need, connectivity, which was again a little bit of a challenge initially, uh, and give them and meet their primary needs people thrive and some of the people perhaps who we were worried that would, would really struggle once we put into um, perhaps sort of quite quite isolated accommodation in a hotel or in, in an apartment block actually actually got on very well and are still getting on very well um, and that's what that's an enabled us to do and I'll get onto it a little more detail is actually start to really work with individuals around um, 
what what we can do in terms of moving them forward into their, their own secure permanent accommodation um, and and that's been a real positive and, and and i think across the whole of the, of the sector in, in in england we've really thought what 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 lessons is this 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 this, 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 this teaching us and and how can we respond further as as we move into um, the next stage with, and 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 very much about not returning to normal business so moving on to my to my next slide um if you just bear with me a second i just need to get back onto the slide so a little bit for myself um, um what is this, what is the general way in which we support homeless people, not just in Leicester, across across the, the England and the UK wider? Um, I think previous to everyone in, the approach was very much around um, how do we support manage people on the street. So the very much the staircase model that we've had for many years, and 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 to be fair, I've worked in it and 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 managed and supported over many years, is that. You know, we, we, we try and engage people on the streets. We try then to get them into temporary accommodation. We then try and get them probably into slightly more secure accommodation, but it still won't be their own home. And maybe at some point we'll be able to move them on to their own accommodation, their own flat or their own, their, their own um, individual tenancy. And all of that comes with lots of conditions, you know, that people need to address their drug and alcohol problem, or we need to make sure that they can manage and cope independently. Um, they need to show sort of commitments around uh, managing things like rent uh, uh, and the other obligations they have in terms of, of, of being a tenant as well. And so what we've in, we've done so long is, is put barriers. We put barriers in, uh, in front of everybody at every step, and then um, and then are surprised when people. Um, aren't able to overcome those barriers or, uh, and fall out of the system and come back round again. And so we've very much been operating a revolving door system around homeless services. Um, the, the other key area um, that we have, which, which comes into some of the discussion that we had, Simon had about how do we, what is our approach to supporting homeless people? Um, very much a lot of the public narrative and a lot of the actually government and local authority narrative is about how do we sustain people on the street so we have a lots of um, investment into day services so if people are sleeping out at night they can get a breakfast in the morning uh, we have lots of voluntary action around soup kitchens and sleeping bags and that sort of thing um, and very much a sort of like managing a problem you know we manage people to be homeless um, and actually what we need to do is actually start managing the problem and actually solving the problem and the only way you can really solve the problem is, is the giving people a home and giving people a secure home but what we need to do is take away the conditionality that we've been set but that we've been um using over the over, over the past years and decades that that means that we we almost ration that and, and we only give people um a home when they've earned it almost. They have to demonstrate and prove that they're, that, that they're deserving of a, a, a tenancy. And that's very much the system that I've been experiencing over the 30 years I've been working in homelessness as well. So moving on to the, the, the next slide. Um, so as I said, how have we responded? So you know, generally funding and, and, and the homeless system and services uh, have been around creating that th those structures around supporting people. Um, and we get, campaigns on a yearly basis to use empty bills, building as homeless hostels um, uh, and, and often finding them sort of campaigns to place, you know, safe places to sleep rough and, and, and some of those issues. But actually what we should really be doing is fighting for a human, the human right for a safe and secure home. Um, and, and, you know, that is taking um, still some time to uh, change perceptions and change the way we do that and the recent rough sleeping strategy that the government announced I think we're now into the third year of that um, it's still very much focused on managing the problem um, how do we create more safe spaces that people can come in by and large they are in dormitory accommodation or that they're, they're, they're only for one night and you have to go away and book again the next night so we're constantly reinforcing that that sense of homelessness that sense of insecurity um, and actually, what the, what everybody in is, and the, and the COVID um, pandemic has has done is is actually taken away a lot of those things that we can't actually use anymore. So we can't go back to using night shelters. 
um, over this winter and hopefully further forward. We won't be opening soup kitchens hopefully anytime soon. Um, we actually have had to think about how do we provide proper secure homes and have shown that we can do it. Okay, there's some economic factors around that in terms of you know, um, the fact that hotels have been empty, uh, student accommodation is perhaps not being used in the same way. So, but we've used those opportunities to actually find, to, to find the type of home that, that we need for people. Moving on in terms of how do we create this um, wider uh, agenda and, and sort of, you know, and campaign to, to, to think about how we do things differently. Um, just over four years ago now, we, we um, joined a campaign called the Ending, um, European Ending Street Homeless Campaign. It's run by an organisation called World Habitat. I suggest if you, if you want to find out a little bit more about their work, um, go into the website, um, very simple World Habitat, but they campaign around having decent habitats, decent homes and decent places to live. Um, and we joined up with that with that campaign and that's got 13 cities spread across Europe. Um, I think eight are in the UK, uh, but they go as far as Bratislava, uh, Brussels, you know, big range Barcelona, very much about learning and sharing. Um, and they very much come back to a sort of philosophy and a campaign that actually the only way you're really going to solve homelessness in a community is to get that everybody to accept as a joint responsibility. Um, and, and this concept is a little bit from America. We might find a little bit tweet, but actually that, every, that, that everybody's a neighbour and, and just because somebody is homeless doesn't, not, doesn't mean they're no longer your neighbour. You know, how do we take a joint responsibility and accountability that for what happens in, in our neighbourhoods and in our localities and, and set that as a, a something that uh, we should all do something about? That's led to some really good work locally in terms of partnership. Um, and led to the event of a homeless charter. Again, easily accessible if you if you if you Google or, or type in homeless charter, you, Leicester, you'll you'll come up with that. Um, and very much around how do we work more effectively together, but not just as homeless agencies or local authorities, but how do we involve community? How do we involve business? How do we involve uh, faith groups? How do we get everybody to work together? Um, cohesively to, to tackle homelessness and, and one of the key things one how do we provide more uh, sustainable and affordable homes which uh, again I think Joe started off with as being the key to, to handling homelessness in, in, a, in a place. Um, as I said the next challenge is no return to normal some of those are about dealing with the public health crisis of the pandemic um, have been have made that we've got no choice we can't return to normal um, and so what do we do? What's the next step, really? And, and one of the things that we've definitely championed um, and which the European campaign champions is the, the housing first model. Um, housing first is a model that's developed in the US and it's been adopted by a number of U, um, European countries and it's now getting more and more momentum within the UK. Um, and moving on, I'll, ju I'll just give you a little bit of background what, what housing first is. Um, so the overall philosophy, First and foremost is to buy somebody a stable roof, a stable home, and, and give them a stable roof. Um, it, it, it understands that actually, if you continue to put barriers and obstacles in front of people before you give that home, you're never going to solve anything. You're never actually, all you're doing is managing a problem. You're not solving that problem. And so, once you give people a home, all of those things that actually we all take for granted are suddenly put in place. So, that, 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 that um, psyche that people change from just surviving from survival mode then turns very quickly into um, more than just just surviving and coping but how do I thrive how do I start to to have a, a, a meaningful and, and positive life uh, and my well-being and health and all those other issues it does recognize that people often need quite intensive and personal support um, you know, the, the, many of the, the long term rough sleepers that we work with within Leicester have very, very complex needs. And to be fair, but I've also been around our homeless system uh, uh, many times. Um, one of the things I, I often try to stress to, 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 to my staff and, and new people that come in to work with homelessness is that if you continually experience failure through the homeless system, you will become incredibly ambivalent to that system. Because whatever you do or however hard you try, 
um, you're never going to succeed. You'd never, never jump over those barriers that the homeless system has put up to you for you in the past. So, so you just accept, you know, that, that nothing is going to be different. And, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we have. How do we, how do we overcome that sort of ambivalence that people have almost taken on? That just, just nothing can be different. It can be better. We very much uh, feel that we need to champion this idea that uh, secure housing is not a luxury. It's not something that uh, there's a reward that everybody has the right to that uh, and, and deserves that. Um, and, you know, we need to make sure that we start challenging that. Uh, and that can be quite complex when you start to get into um, essentially trying to uh, manage a very um, a very limited resource that we have. A city like Leicester has a huge housing problem. It's the affordability and the access to housing. So in terms of public perception around, most people will be very sympathetic if they, for, in terms of a rough sleep and saying that person, you know, yes, of course deserves somewhere to live. But when you get into more complex issues about who gets priority over housing, when you start to say, well, some of the complexities that come with those individuals that they have a drug problem or they, um, that their that, 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 that anti-social behavior could be an issue at times, they might not always the best neighbor. And people start to say, hold on a minute, why are they getting priority over somebody else who perhaps is seen as a, a model tenant or, 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 or as different? So we start to prioritize, and that's one of the problems. When you're fighting over a very scant resource, you know, it becomes very difficult and very emotive for people who, who should be put forward first and who should be prioritized. But if we are really gonna attack tackle homelessness in, in the UK, we have to recognise that housing has to be the first thing that we do. Um, it, it's not a reward, it's, it's actually the, 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 the prerequisite of, of making a difference to people's lives. So what's next in Leicester um, in terms of um, over the next few months and moving forward? Um, I say we found housing for over 350 people over the last six months. Um, but unfortunately, the tap is still running. The, the an analogy I'm using at the moment is that we're slowly turning the taps off, um, uh, turning the taps on um, in terms of new presentations around homelessness. But the chances are, with the economic impact over the next few months of COVID, we're probably going to get another set of taps at the other end of the bath that are also going to start running pretty quickly as well. Um, we've not solved rough sleeping, we've not solved homelessness. So we're going to continue to be challenged over the next months and years in terms of how do we meet demands for people um, and we know actually that was quite a surprise I think for quite a lot of um, people within the city that there were quite so many people that suddenly came out who were vulnerable in terms of housing who'd been, who had, hadn't got secure housing and the, and, the, and the COVID crisis suddenly forced those people out of where they were uh, and onto the street, and and, and that that that's been quite sober, and I think for for some politicians and some you know and others in terms of thinking about well how do how do we tackle our issues within within our city? We need to shift the emphasis. Um, we need to support people in the community uh, where they live. Um, we need to not. Uh, and there's a lot of um, social capital who are very and very passionate, and people are very passionate about tackling homelessness. We need to make sure that 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 capital and that and that desire to 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 to, to change the the narrative and, and to tackle homelessness is is very much focused and helping where it can can really make a difference. And that often is actually helping people in their community, in their homes, giving people that connectivity that Joe was talking about. What we found um, and we've done repeatedly in the system that we we have a very um, idealized out what, what 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 home looks like for people so yes we say here you go here's your four walls look you've got everything you need you've got a nice kitchen you've got a, you've got your own bathroom you're in a block of your know, flats there's other people around you but actually for many of the people that they they have no they have no connectivity with with that community and, and often will probably be ostracized by that community as well so how do we help people um become part of the community and, and I think there's a real real opportunity for us to use some of that social capital that perhaps previously had been into setting up night shelters or temporary night shelters or street or, or doing street work or doing um, um, doing soup kitchens actually can we help can, can we turn that that capital in and that support into helping people start to thrive and develop a, a, a social network and support within in, in the places that they're in. We still have to turn off the tap, um, and that's a much bigger system issue. And, and as Joe said, that's very much around affordable housing. You know, if we do not have access to affordable housing, 
Um, and one of the perverse things around this this pandemic is we've seen how prices uh, um, shoot through the roof still more. Um, accessibility um, for housing, um, if you're on low incomes in the city of Leicester, it's still very difficult. We did get a slight increase in the benefit cap um, in terms of people have been able to, to, to get benefits to a certain level, but it's still well below what would be the market rate if you were trying to rent a flat within the city. So we, you know, why we still have those fundamentals. Um, and the other thing that I think is really key for us, and this is one of the things that's the heart of Housing, um, housing First, and it's the heart of um, the Any Street Homeless campaign and the Homeless Charter in the city, is actually the way that we learn and the way that we develop services and get it right is by listening to those with lived experience. Um, we, we are still not very good at that as, as a homeless sector. We still do on to rather than with. Um, we don't co-produce particularly well with people. We don't listen to people's experience. Some of that's the challenges around homelessness. Often people are in a very transitory situation. They move through a system or people are already temporary in, in terms of where they are. And actually, um, uh, you know, engaging with people can be a challenge. And, and that's been a real challenge over the last six months as well. But actually, you know, without listening to that lived experience, we're never going to get this right and we're never going to get it better. So. I think that's all for me. Yeah. Mark, thank you very much indeed. I think that's been really interesting to hear some of the experiences, uh, not just during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but what happened before then and linking in with the European End Street Homelessness Campaign, explaining a bit about housing first, I think has been very interesting. And it's linked back with Simon's talk when we're thinking about barriers. Simon was talking about some of the physical barriers that we see structured in through the architecture in our cities. You're talking about social and legal barriers, uh, the hoops that people have to jump through. And I think the last point you've you've made, you know, around challenging perceptions, I think is key. And we will make sure that there are some questions coming in. And I can see one is about what people can do to help. So we'll, we'll make sure that we hear that question and you can give a few more ideas on that. But Mark Grant, CEO of Action Homeless, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I'm now going to care. ask. I'm going to ask Mark Charlton. So if you turn your microphone and camera off for now, lovely. I'm going to ask um, Mark Charlton from Tomalfit University just to talk about how DMU has its social heart, where its social value is. So Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Joe, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, De Montfort University, which we believe is a university with social value at its heart. And um, I want to talk about it in the context of how we try to um, tackle challenges arising from current, current issues around COVID-19 and also um, issues related to homelessness so i hope it brings home some of the work that we're trying to do and and the value of that work so the one university uh, celebrates uh, its 150 150th year this year and we've always felt that we are responsive to the community's needs from it, from its very first foundations and uh, throughout its history the university has evolved to respond to the needs of the city through employ, uh, employers needing a highly trained workforce to challenges the city has faced and our teaching and learning has been responsive for that uh, for 150 years. We very much see ourselves as a civic university for Leicester that is responsive and, and has uh, a public good and the good of our city community at its core and over the years this has involved uh, evolved into a strategic mission so we have um, now a mandate from the strategic plan of the university to serve our city and we do that in a number of ways so we do that through our teaching and research focuses but we also have a public engagement team which is there to drive this agenda forward and this is something that's become uh, something of an identity for the university. Um, and uh, it's been also recognised by the United Nations. And we are now uh, the United Kingdom's only uh, UN SDG 16 hub. Uh, and I'll talk about the relevance of that a little bit more uh, along the way. 
And one of the reasons we're so committed to uh, being uh, a university with social value at its heart is that actually it um, develops our teaching so that our teaching is relevant, that we're giving students the appropriate skills to uh, take out into the workplace or into society when they graduate. And it also en enriches our research in that we understand better the needs of the city and support those who are actors in the city to uh, respond to societal challenges better. And the photo you can see in, on the slide is uh, that of uh, DMU Local and uh, we have a huge volunteering wing uh, uh, led by the DMU Local team um, where hundreds of students get involved in community activities each year. And some of those volunteering activities uh, involve, involve supporting homeless charities in the city. So um, I'd like to talk briefly about our COVID-19 response. Um, when the uh, pandemic broke in Leicester, we enacted an immediate humanitarian response. And the photo you can see on the screen uh, was a remarkable piece of work by the public engagement team to actually take over one of our sports facilities and turn it into a distribution center for the East Midlands, sending out hundreds of uh, pieces of uh, uh, PPE uh, to the NHS and local care homes and other charities uh, throughout the pandemic. And um, that, that was a, quite a remarkable response. But we also, as well as uh, uh, leading a humanitarian response, we uh, developed a strategic response because we were acutely aware that the impacts of the pandemic could last several years. Uh, and that's certainly a prediction from most economists now that we won't get ourselves back into a uh, position to where we left um, to up to seven years. So in turn, we followed a UN uh, call to build back better. And this was uh, um, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations um, called on actors to build back better as a SDG 16 hub. We uh, thought this was uh, a really important piece of work uh, to do. So in the spirit of working with our communities, we held a huge consultation, uh, which involved uh, a uh, significant number of people and community organisations, uh, both uh, in a public consultation, a business consultation and uh, frontline community group consultations. And in all of those consultations that were led by the university, there was a willingness to collaborate and um, come up with new ideas. And, and in the end, around 300 ideas were put forward and we developed a focus group which drilled them down into the 30 most important areas we felt uh, that the, the communities felt that were should be tackled and homelessness uh, were featured highly in those uh, 30 uh, policy recommendations. So um, for the, those of you who may have seen uh, some of the uh, coverage in the uh, local media about this, but uh, the specific recommendations that came from the community to uh, um, drive the um, homelessness issue forward were to uh, reignite the uh, Leicester's Homelessness Charter, which Mark mentioned in his presentation. There's lots of good recommendations in that charter, so do look at it. And uh, we're in the process of trying to re-engage uh, the university and other organisations in the city with the findings of that charter, the recommendations of that charter. We also want to create new initiatives with uh, partners to reduce homelessness. That was the that was a key recommendation in the consultation. Uh, the our university was asked to lead some strategic thinking about new research ideas of how what we can learn about the homelessness issue in in Leicester and how we can pioneer some uh, uh, new initiatives going forward. Given that COVID nineteen as uh, Mark outlined in his presentation, uh, presents uh, quite a unique s scenario, particularly in the circumstance of the everybody in campaign and, and the city being able to be so proactive at the start to get uh, those rough sleepers and the homelessness people off the streets. Um, another key recommendation was to assist the World Hab Habitat European End Street Homelessness Campaign 
and create a city without street homelessness. And a final recommendation was to um, design cost-effective accommodation and work with the private rented sector to try and uh, create some kind of long-term solutions to these challenges. So in the past, we've had some uh, great success um, with um, working with Action Homeless and other partners in terms of how we've uh, um, identified issues related to homelessness. So in November 17, we did a huge uh, homeless street count with Action Homeless and other agencies in the city and Leicester City Council. So, And from the photo, you'll see uh, our multi-agency approach. So there's Joe uh, from the university uh, with Mark being interviewed by ITV and there's a small army of volunteers made up of around 80 DMU students and uh, another um, significant number of uh, volunteers from local agencies across the city and over one night in November that, that this group of uh, volunteers mapped 18 zones of Leicester to uh, try to expose the tr true scale of homelessness in the city and uh, it came out with some pretty impactful findings um, and um, identified the some of the complex health needs that Mark had uh, uh, explained earlier in his uh, presentation. Um, issues around, uh, so 40%, for example, experiencing a traumatic episode in their life, which was uh, significant. One of the outcomes of, of the final report, which you can find online, um, if you Google DMU homelessness report, it, it, it's, it comes up straight away. Uh, the actual collaboration between the, the university and um, agencies like Action Homeless uh, were praised um, for being able to take this multi-agency rep report. So what I've described is, is a 24-hour period where uh, lots of volunteers and, and agencies went out overnight to uh, try and capture the true scale of homelessness in Leicester, but actually it took several months to prepare for that 24-hour uh, um, impact. So it, it, it sounds like an overnight success, but actually it was months in the planning and that was praised in how the agencies went about working together to deliver this piece of work. And it was a valuable piece of work because the data provided long-term impacts and was able to uh, allow uh, the local authority and um, some of the agencies the evidence uh, that they required to uh, put cases forward to um, government and to unlock funding to support the uh, homelessness issue in the city. So, given the the current um, the, the current uh, mandate from the COVID nineteen consultations, we want to take some of those ideas forward now. We think it's very important. Um, firstly, as, as I mentioned before, DMU is uh, the um, SDG 16 hub for United Nations Academic Impact, which is a real honour for the university, but it's also a, a great responsibility that we are um, responsive uh, as a, a strong institution in the city, the city of Leicester to, uh, to act on the recommendations of the report. SDG 16, which is Peace, Justice and Strong Institutions, um, is uh, a very um, enabling SDG. So there are 17 UN SDGs uh, and there is not a single SDG uh, specifically for homelessness, but SDG 16 is a significant driver of, of that. And um, as Simon pointed out in his presentation, um, there is a, uh, a growth uh, both uh, nationally and globally in the uh, criminalization of the homeless and SDG 16 has a mandate to try and reduce that criminal criminalization but uh, and actually to uh, promote the rule of law and also the right of adequate housing for homeless people. And also in doing so triggers uh, other SDGs, including SDG 2, uh, Hunger, SDG 3, Health, SDG 4, Education, SDG 11, Safer Communities. And as a university uh, with the hub responsibility, 
we want to promote the idea that uh, SDG 16 is uh, key to uh, supporting um, our homeless community in Leicester and uh, hopefully paving the way to a better a future. So what we're currently doing, uh, given the uh, 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 recommendations from from the COVID-19 consultations is creating working groups to lead some of the initiatives identified and these working groups are open to uh, local agencies and um, Mark from Action Homeless has been uh, with us throughout this uh, project and I'm delighted to say he's he's going to be sticking with us. Uh, Joe who also on on this call who who's a researcher in this field, has also agreed to join a working group, as has a number of businesses who see uh, it actually to be good business to support um, people out of homelessness. And uh, also people, lots of lots of different agencies who are working in fields related to homelessness. So we're going to start working on new initiatives together very quickly. And fundamentally, the uh, the work of the working group will be responsive to the needs of homeless people. The university has had great success, it, probably its best success, when it's co-created its solutions with uh, the communities of need. And we see this as a vital uh, uh, strategy um, in the um, support of homeless homelessness and, and the issue in Leicester. And we'll take a multi-agency approach, as I've just mentioned. And we, um, for those of you uh, who are academics or students um, on, on this call, we very much want to encourage you to be part of this project. And we, we would welcome you uh, to participate and bring your skills and your enthusiasm to um, the, the uh, working group as we take it forward. Ultimately, we want to position this piece of work and all the pieces of work as we support our city um, out of the um, lockdown period and then into the recovery period of the pandemic. We want the university to use its skills, knowledge and expertise to be the driver of social change in the city. And whether you're a member of public or a uh, student or, or a member of staff at the university, I would encourage you to get involved. You can find details of the uh, DMU Community Solutions um, report online again if you google it it's, it's quite easy to find and through that you can see how you can join a working group and and potentially support the work of uh, um, creating solutions for homeless people or also another uh, area of the COVID-19 recovery that might interest you so that's uh, that's me and I hopefully I've outlined the um, how the university is has social value at its heart, particularly at, at this challenging time in, in the pandemic. So I'd like to hand back to Joe. Thank you. Um, Mark, thank you very much indeed. In fact, Mark Grant, Simon Stevens, Mark Shelton, thank you very much for those presentations. I think they've given us a really good insight and some different approaches, different ideas uh, to come out of that. We've had a, uh, a few um, questions come through on the chat and um, Bear with me, I'm going to try and make sure that we cover them all. Um, but I'm sure if you've got any questions that we can't answer during this, uh, we are very contactable at DMU. So if you Google the, the research that Mark talked about um, just now, you'll find all sorts of links to contact us. Um, I'm on Twitter at social housing. You know, pop a question in and we'll happily follow up with anyone if we can't cover everything during this next half an hour, 25 minutes, in fact. I've got a few questions I'm going to ask. Um, and this one came in quite early on um, during the, the discussions. Um, and this is from the questioner. They say that uh, I have heard that homeless hostels are quite unsafe for the residents, so they prefer rough sleeping. Um, I was going to start off with this and I'm going to hand over to, to uh, Mark Grant. I think it's very interesting. And actually, it's an interesting question. The, the wording in the question is interesting. So I think possibly nobody prefers uh, rough sleeping. But there are um, dangers in, in some uh, temporary accommodation uh, that people would obviously prefer to be in a home, but they prefer not to be in that temporary accommodation. So even the way we question it, I guess we need to be mindful of that. So no one would prefer rough sleeping, um, but they, they may feel that they, they feel unsafe in their home. And just before I hand over to Mark, there is um, a journal article 
a highly readable prize-winning journal article by a, a colleague um, in Belfast, Lynn McMordy, um, who talks about avoidance strategies, stress appraisal and coping with hostel accommodation. Um, she very much says that living in temporary accommodation can impact negatively on social and emotional well-being particularly where it's poor quality, large scale or congregate in nature. And when we think about that, particularly in, in um, the context of COVID-19, uh, we can see that, of course, that that's the case. Um, uh, Lynn goes on to say, um, homeless people who abandon or avoid temporary accommodation are often viewed as holding beliefs, characteristics or traits that render them unable or unwilling to make choices which prioritise their own well-being. And actually, her article goes on to debunk that assumption um, because the, the choice of not being in some temporary accommodation is entirely rational. It's not irrational. It's not a deep held belief that's anti some kind of safe, secure space. It's that the space that that person is in um, is not safe. Um, and I happen to just this morning have caught up on uh, Desert Island Discs and heard Sam Morton uh, re would recommend the episode to anyone. Um, the, the actor, uh, and, and she talks about her experience uh, as a younger person um, in some of the, the homeless accommodation. So I think it's a fascinating question. It's something that we need to deconstruct when we talk about how we challenge perceptions. Um, but it's a very, very interesting question. Um, I've given my view on it. I'd be very interested to hear Mark Grant from Action Homeless and um, some thoughts that you might have on this. I, I, I think it's a very good question and a very good point. I, I think. Um, back to some of my presentation, every person is very individual and has very different needs and their life experiences and experiences they have in the homeless system very much impacts on those. I think I agree to a certain extent, we are operating institutions, we set up a system within the UK in which how we deal with housing, some of that is um, a little bit around deserving and undeserving um, a little bit. Um, I sort of joke in a little way that we, how far have we moved from a, a workhouse type uh, environment where if you hit the bottom of, 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 we, of people see society, you're only allowed so much of a leg up, so we'll give you somewhere to live, but it won't be that great, it won't be that brilliant, and we'll give you a little bit of food and some benefits, and we haven't moved massively away from that in my view. Yes, and, we, and Action Homeless runs an institution, we run a 30 plus bed hostel, or we did before COVID, um, that invariably puts lots of very complex people with lots of very complex needs together uh, and obviously that is difficult and difficult for those people living there and difficult in many ways for us to manage. Um, I think we've come a long way in terms of the services that we offer. When I first started in the homeless sector, we still had to, in, in the middle of London, we had what was called spikes where you had, there was one hostel in the middle of central London that had 250 people sleeping there any one night. Um, and for those of you who have heard of Arlington House, the infamous Arlington House, um, I, I worked to shift there where, where I was told very clearly um, I was not to leave the room, the office, which was um, massively double glazed with security there. Whatever happened, I was never to leave that office. So if I was unsafe, imagine the people living there. We've moved a long way, but we still warehouse people effectively. We still put lots of people. COVID has challenged that. We can't put people on mattresses. We can't pull people together in the same way. And it goes back to, to, to the principles of housing first, really. We're only, if, if we keep putting people in those temporary accommodation, um, often we are setting them up to fail. Um, and I wonder why, actually, you know, they abandon or we end up with behaviours that it means that for our safety and the safety of others and the safety of the staff, that we end up saying you, you need to leave as well. Um, you know, we do need to provide homes uh, it's a challenge. You can't provide an instant home every time somebody comes homeless. So how do you do that? And I think that's something the sector uh, are still trying to work through. And how do we do that? But yes, to a certain extent, I agree with that. That that that, that people may make the choices and may think actually I feel safer. I think often it's about other more complex issues around control uh, of your life and, and being able to you know it, you know often if you're on the street you are able to have much more. Uh, independence and control in terms of what happens to you. Uh, invariably, institutions have rules and the ways in which they work um, and to, to try and ensure everybody's safe. So that, that often is quite difficult for people. But yeah, they're not ideal. Uh, and we, we, you know, and again, we need to move forward. And uh, and again, that's that's one of the things that uh, of, of everybody in and, and the pandemic is that 
we're not going to be able to hopefully go back to those days and can we move on and come up with a different way of doing that and that's the real challenge for the, the homeless sector as much as anybody else actually and how we do that i'm still hearing um, night shelter providers who are very frustrated that they can't reopen their dormitories rather than thinking well let's let's think of you know really should we be hankry to open going back yeah you know into those situations and, and what do we do about going forward as well Mark, thank you. I'm totally with you. We want to um, end homelessness, not manage homelessness. It shouldn't be right that um, anyone goes without a home. So I think that's a really good point uh, to end your answer on. Thank you. Um, I've got a few questions coming through and I'll, I'll try and cover them all. But one question I would like to ask, um, and this probably brings in um, uh, Mark and Simon, because um, I think both of your presentations, Mark Grant and Simon, both your presentations touched on this. Um, this is about the need to shift perceptions. Um, Simon, you, you talked a bit about how this is built in, structurally built into our, our environment, these perceptions, whether they're spikes or unpleasant music or sounds. Um, these result from people being maybe scared or sceptical, um, and, and this is so ingrained. So I'm just wondering, um, looking to the future, what do you think that we can do? And we'll start with, with Simon and then go on to, to Mark Grant. What do you think we can do to start to challenge these perceptions in order to shift the debate? So I think the, the biggest thing that I just sort of was trying to conclude on in my presentation that it's actually about uh, taking a look at ourselves a little bit. So, you know, like I said, anything that we often perceive as antisocial behavior in public space is actually d down to the fact that we have access to private rooms. And so what we see in public space as being antisocial is just something that we, because we expect someone to do it at home. So we need to take a, a real hard look at ourselves in that sense and realize that that's almost inevitable that we're going to do that because it, you know, privacy does create the idea that there are some things that should be done in privacy. And to, but to um, impose that upon a group of people who don't have access to that is really quite arbitrary and t totally unfair. So I think that will charge political will to end homelessness. And I'm I'm not really uh, afraid to say that I sort of, in terms of actual policy then procedure and things like that, I, I think the first thing really that, well, one of the fundamental things that needs to happen is universal basic income. And I think one of the problems implicitly with any kind of welfare solution is it will include a set of degrading criteria and questions, investigative procedures. And I mean, like Mark has already said, the whole idea of deserving, undeserving, poor. And it also sort of wraps up in that whole kind of homo economicus idea, right? If you're not somehow making an economic contribution to society, then you're, you're kind of somehow less than. And I think all this stuff is going to collapse anyway when we have an automated workforce and various different things. But slightly, slight tangent there. But I guess I would, you know, I would, prefer, I firmly put my stool behind the idea of universal basic income, not just because what it does practically, but how it actually reshapes the idea of contribution, work, and a contributing member of society. All those things come out of a universal basic income. I think. Thank you, Simon. Have you got anything to add, Mark Grant? I, I think I agree with Simon it's, it's around how we challenge that that premise that somehow it's people's choices or uh, and people have made uh, wrong decisions or continue to make the wrong decisions. Um, you know, for for many of the people that we work with, um, they are um, have been incredibly let down by the uh, the social care system, often very much even from before birth actually. Uh, you know. Uh, and and that's reinforced time and time again that they're, they're they're usually and often uh, re-traumatized by their experiences um, of that system, um, and it is a real challenge. And we, and we need to need to accept that that actually for many for for, for the people who end up um, on our streets and, and and living on our streets that it, it isn't a choice. And I, and I myself myself using the term lifestyle. It's not a lifestyle choice. It's not, nobody's made that choice. It's, it, it, it's simply, you know, how people have, have learned to cope and, and how to manage given, given their lives and their circumstances. I think the other thing that we need to really challenge is, is, is that it's just a housing issue. It's not, it's a health and social care issue predominantly. We need to make sure that um, increasingly uh, that we get 
people to recognise the these sophisticated joined up approaches from uh, adult social care services, mental health services, primary health services. Um, they need to work together. Um, we've got many examples where we've worked really hard to find the housing that people need. Um, we put all those in place, but actually the support that they need around those other issues is simply not there. And that's what Housing First is trying to challenge a little bit as we're trying, trying to, to do that. But yes, we, we, we need to move around that. But yes, we need we need to challenge perceptions that somehow it's a choice. Um, and, and people have made that that that, that decision to, to, to live their lives in the way and for, for most of them they have had little or no control over their lives um, and, and often have had it taken away. Um, and, 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 and lots of ways. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Um, I've got two questions that I'm going to put together. Um, one question is, are there plans for a new homelessness count and survey in 2020? Um, I'll start it off, but then I think uh, Mark Charles and Mark Grant come, come in on this um, to help me, please. Um, there, when we did the count in 2017, November 2017, it was the first physical count that had been done for over a decade, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, it had been based on estimates before then uh, for the official um, communities and local government department count. Um, I think it does need doing more regularly, obviously, than every 10 years uh, to get that. There are flaws in the methodology of a homelessness count. It does depend on a number of factors but it is important to, to get out there um, and undertake this i think as much as we would like to undertake a, a physical count in 2020 it's going to be quite difficult to do that i think coming out of the covid19 pandemic so it's possibly more likely that we'd be looking at next year to do something i think i would like to do something similar to the event we did in 2017 um, and I think I would like to, to look at this in relation to the Homelessness Charter as well. We do have plans in the Faculty of Business and Law um, in terms of having some kind of event um, in the late spring, early summer, um, a sort of unconference, if you will, or a citizens convention. Um, and I think that this topic of homelessness will be a, a part of that. Um, so there'll be something to get involved in but I'm not sure whether we can say that there would be a count um, event in 2020. Uh, Mark Charlton, I don't know if you were to come in um, and, and add anything to that. Um, uh, well, yeah, I think that doing a, delivering accounts is going to be difficult. I also think there might just be something around what data people like Mark and others need from, from the current scenario and how we move forward. So whether doing a, a crude count um, and, and perhaps the fact that the, uh, Mark and others have been able to take so many people off the streets and probably have a better idea of where people are now than they ever have before, what, what the value of a count would be. I think there's perhaps some other things that, that potentially we need to know uh, as, as we move forward and, and support people. Uh, to to remain um, in and not and not have to return back to the streets. That would be my guess. Yeah, spot on. Thank you. And that links to what you were saying earlier, um, Mark Grant. Just before I bring you in, there was kind of a second question that I wanted to group before I, I brought brought this to you. Because uh, we've got Francis, who's a student, who's posted this question. Basically, wants to know how can I help. This is the question from Francis. I think a number of people listening to this will have this question. Uh, so uh, from a student perspective, it might link in, you know, you might want to talk about what people can do in terms of volunteering, supporting out homeless. Um, but for, for uh, me and for Mark Charlton and Mark Grant and us at DMU to think about how we can support students to help. Uh, there are a number of activities and events that we have in mind uh, that we can keep students in touch with. But for this question right now, I think Francis is asking Mark Grant, how can I help Action Homeless? Okay, yeah, happy to, to answer both of those. In terms of account, um, no, it's going to be very difficult to do something on that scale. But uh, having said that, um, the not 2017 count was the catalyst for us to continue to do regular counts. Um, so up to the pandemic, we were actually doing bi-monthly um, hotspot checks. So we were going out to verify and, and find out who's out there. We are going to do a, um, 
account in November. Um, we're required to do that by central government anyway. That, that's what Joe referred previously. That was always an estimate for the last three years where we've, we've done an actual count and we will be going out. The great thing about the pandemic, and if there is a great thing, is that we've managed to find so many people and we've managed to get a real grip of just how many people are around the system because we had to bring them all in. And they all came in because suddenly the support and services weren't out there. So to, 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 to sustain on the street was, became very, very difficult. Um, the real challenge, I think, for me, out to, to, to DMU and others, is actually what we really need to know is how many people are at risk of rust sleeping. Uh, you know, so that sudden increase that we got 150 people in, and then you know we saw another 150 people almost within another three weeks. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of people at risk, you know, how many people generally know, and that's always been a little bit of the holy grail around homelessness. We can count rust sleepers and. And, and it's also a tip of iceberg and it's a barometer and it can be all sorts of and a benchmark. But actually the real the real bit within our cities are how many people are vulnerable and generally are at risk of that. And that's the challenge out a little bit. I think the other challenge around how people can get involved is, is a little bit around uh, experiences, lived experiences. And we're, we're, we're going to be trying to launch some work over the next few months around how do we talk to people. And that's one of definitely, I think, students can get involved in that, listen to people's experiences and, and, and collecting some of that information as well if people want to get directly hands-on again it's still difficult a lots of services are shut and obviously we have to think about being COVID secure and what we can do but actually if you go onto the um if you go into um the charter website it will direct you to um a um uh, the, the leicester give leicester website that has a list of lots of the agencies that you can get involved in and what you can do action homeless um uh, do, does use volunteers actually mainly in our uh, mostly food provision rather than our direct uh, access hostel at the moment but there are lots of organizations and that's I think part of the narrative going forward a little bit you know how can we get community to start getting involved and doing things slightly different a little bit and and some of that work we're going to be carrying out over the next few months as not just as action homeless as a sector you know what does it look differently how can we reshape the way that we do things in Leicester over the next few few weeks and months coming out of hopefully the, the pandemic Thank you for that, Mark. And I think it's important to have gone back to that point you made in your presentation about shifting the emphasis. I think sometimes we have um, visual ideas in our head as to what it looks like to help homeless people. Um, and, and these times it's not necessarily about going out there. It's not necessarily cooking food or providing sleeping bags. Um, it might be less physical. It might be less visible than that. Um, you know, it it might be looking at almost a skills bank approach, some coaching, this kind of thing to help provide that um, support. Um, but it, it, I think we are shifting emphasis. So I think it's a really important point you made. Um, but Francis, thank you again for the question. It's really good to have had that. Um, and if you've got any other questions, if you want to get involved in this at the university, say either Twitter or email. Uh, Mark, Charlton and I can respond to you um, and see how we can help you um, help us, if you like. I've got a couple more questions. I notice it's just coming up uh, towards 5.2 and I want to stop this promptly at 2 o'clock because people have other things to go on to. Um, but I wanted to just note um, two questions that I've had. Um, the first one is from Tracy and Milton Keynes, who says that um, she agrees that co-creation is vital. Um, and in Milton Keynes, this perhaps hasn't been at the fault and is looking to engage with us directly um, in order to kind of learn some of the methods um, in, in co-creation. Um, I think we would very much welcome that, Tracy. We're very open to that. Um, so please do get in touch. Um, either Google me, Joe Richardson at DMU, and you'll find my email address. You can get in contact and then we can have a further discussion. Um, but there's lots to learn and it's not uh, a one way um, system either. We're always learning um, and I think it's more sharing uh, than learning. So yes, please get in touch and, and we can talk more about that. Um, the last question I can see that's come through um, and this is a question, if a homeless person brackets wider definition, and I'm going to come to that in a moment because we focused on street homelessness here, if a homeless person wants to do a degree and fully able to do a degree, could the university do this free of charge with accommodation and support involved? You'll forgive me if I can't answer that directly right now, but I, I would say 
there are a number of ways. There are certainly, um, I think we call them sort of hardship packages. Um, uh, there are bursaries, that sort of thing. Uh, without knowing more about the context, I, I couldn't answer that question, I'm afraid, straight away. Um, but please do get in touch. There'll be um, a, a generic um, email address that you can get in touch with, or by all means, you know, Google me, and I will try and forward your question uh, to the right person at DMU to be able to help answer that. It's an important point, you know, um, that I we must make theory. sure that people can access the education, which is vital. I Sorry, give you a theoretical answer on it, Mark, Joe, because, because we've had yes, uh, do, do. A, long, a long history of supporting um, students who have had all kinds of complex needs from refugee status to other issues. I'm not aware that we've supported a homeless person, but I, I'm quite interested in it now. I've, now I've been prompted because I don't see a reason that that wouldn't be unachievable. So I'm quite interested in the in the challenge of it. So uh, um, yeah, I, I, I think we have been able to do it. And when uh, Karen asked about support, we have extreme good support for students with complex needs. So I think it, it's kind of, if there's a will, there's a way. And a, a student would face all the challenges of not having a permanent address potentially, but if somebody has a kind of address, then that's um, that's uh, uh, you know something that we can work with. Uh, I think Mark wants to. I think it is. I think the the question is also asking about accommodation as well, Mark. So this is somebody who's looking for you know a wide range of support. But it, I think you're absolutely right to have brought up the fact that you know indeed we have uh, we have supported a, a number of different students to come and study at DMU and there's no reason why we can't look into this a little bit more so please if you can find a way um, to, to get in touch with us um, then do that and, and we will respond to you um, I think Mark Grant did you have your hand up just to come in uh, at the end there? It's an interesting point uh, and, and I can see why somebody would think that's a really positive way in which you might tackle something but if you start to unpick it a little bit it starts to come with a lot of conditionality you know so you get your home if you're doing your degree. What happens if you don't do your degree anymore? Do you lose your home? The way to solve accessibility and mobility is back to what we've talked about: is giving people that permanent home, so they can make the choices and they can make those and, and take those opportunities that are there. Really, I think actually, as you've mentioned, how more accessible is university education and others for people um, that have barriers or had experiences in the past that may put barriers in the place. I think that's key and needs to be challenged and needs to be opened up. But we still have to go back that actually ultimately what people need is a decent place to live that they can afford. And then they can make all the choices that they can have and all the opportunities around accessing education, work, whatever that, you know, whatever they want to do. And, and that would be a push, pushing that back really a little bit. Um, you know, keep let's keep challenging yourself. Is that about actually really tackling the root causes? Or is that just a little bit of a yeah, just a bit of tokenism? If, if I'm really honestly and being really challenging around that one, how and what sort of difference would, would that make? Might might for a little bit for the right person, I'd imagine there'd be quite a lot of conditionality before that person would be even offered that scholarship or that that access to that 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 as well, because you you would be saying, oh well, they need to make sure that they finish and you know that they're, they're going to get 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 we're going to get the benefit and they're going to get the benefit. So. Yeah. More conditionality we put in, the more likely or more barriers, the less likely our people are to succeed. Mark, that's an excellent challenge to us. Thank you. And I think this just goes to show the problem um, that I think people want to rush in and help. And actually, okay. it is important to take that deep breath and to think, what do we need to do? How can we structure in change, sustainable change for good? And right at the start, I said, what is it that can help resolve homelessness? And it's a home. Uh, but it's so easy to, to want to rush in and, and help and support. Um, I think that's a really, really salient um, point to end on, Mark. A really good challenge to us as a university to think about where we can support and help, either through the campaign, through the homeless charter, through working with the city, co-creating with different agencies, uh, resolving and supporting those people who are involved, whose bread and butter day-to-day -day role is to 
help end street homelessness. So I, I welcome that challenge. Thank you very much for it. Thank you all very much uh, to our speakers, uh, to Simon Stevens, uh, to Mark Grant, to Mark Charlton, all to um, you for, for listening and watching. Thank you for your questions. Uh, we said, please do get in touch with us. You can Google us quite easily um, through the DMU website. So please do that. Um, but thank you all very much for being here, marking what will be World Homelessness Day tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Cheers.